the dramatic U.S. ban of Huawei, its founder spoke out this week again on national media and won Huawei new fans across China and beyond. What about his words have struck a nerve with so many? Then we explore the repercussions of the Huawei ban. What impact could it have on both the Chinese and American tech industries? Welcome to The Point, an opinion show coming to you from Beijing. I'm Li Xin. As the U.S. continues to isolate the Chinese telecoms giant Huawei, its founder spoke out this week again, and he's found an unlikely ally, Western media. Founder Ren Zhenfei has rarely spoken to media over the past decade until recently. After the U.S. banned Huawei last week, blocking it from buying or using American technology, Ren took to the airwaves again. On Tuesday, he spent some three hours with all of China's major media and his confident, soothing words went viral across the world's most populous nation and beyond. While his ex appearance could be expected, more surprising is how Western media have roundly criticized the U.S. ban. One Bloomberg headline even called it the, quote, nuclear option to halt China's rise. What explains the social media reaction to Ren's words inside China and globally? And what drives the Western media's concern about the ban? Joining me for the discussion in the studio are Thomas Patrick Gale, Executive Director of the Lehman Bush Investment Limited, and Victor Gao, Vice President of the Center for China and Globalization. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. So, uh, Ren Zhenfei once said that from 1987 to 2019, about 32 years, he gave less than 10 interviews, and yet, um, just this year, he, he has appeared a couple of times, mostly to foreign media, however. But on Tuesday, uh, one day after the U.S. announced the 90-day stay to the span, he went on Chinese uh, national TV. Uh, basically, he had many media representatives in the room in the Shenzhen headquarters of the company, and he talked for three hours. He answered questions both from journalists, from various media. He also answered questions from netizens. And then he also gave another interview to a prominent journalist on China Media Group, which was broadcast later repeatedly on the, the, the main news bulletin on the state media. So, um, Victor, how do you think he is, uh, is approaching the situation with such high profile media appearance? I think uh, the majority of the Chinese people and probably the many people in the world now come to the conclusion that Mr. Ren Zhenfei is a man of courage, of vision, of resilience. And he used to be a man of very low profile. He shied media for many years, uh, if not a couple of decades. And recently, he was forced onto the center stage to explain the company, to shed more light, and to try to make the company more transparent, and also with a strong message that is Huawei has done nothing wrong, Huawei is not an enemy of the United States, and if the American government has any doubt about it, you need to come up with real evidence rather than really falsifying such allegations against it. And I think, once again, Mr. Ren demonstrated to the uh, global audience as well as the national audience here in China that he was such an effective and efficient and eloquent spokesperson for Huawei as well as for himself. He's a great hero now um, in China. Well, although he didn't like that title when the, the commentator, when one of the questions um, posed by the, the, one of the journalists was that uh, some people are calling you, Mr. Ren, a national hero, and how do you respond to that? He said, no, I don't, li <laughs> I don't <laughs> like that title. Um, so, Thomas, from observing from an American perspective, uh, were you surprised by the kind of attention, media attention and airtime, and the huge reaction? that has been accorded to the interview and to Mr. Ren himself. No, I think that it goes to um, Mr. Ren has been very smart about how he handles the media in holding them at bay for so long and there's so much pent up interest and in, in demand that he, he didn't rise to the early bait of some of the litigation that went on since 2012 against Huawei and, and stayed, they say, in the United States late in the weeds. Um, so that he could he could come along, and then I think, but coming out now, he presented him as such a charismatic 
individual mm -hmm. and compelling um, to everyone around the world, Americans as well as Chinese and Europeans, that that really sent a strong message on the vitality and um, honor to a certain extent of Huawei. But you seem to kind of suggest that uh, he was doing, th he was being purposely uh, shy, or he was uh, staying purposely away from the media uh, only to come out in order to give more weight to what he says or do you think it's, it's because of the circumstances that made it so that he has to come out to no, answer some of the most important questions? Definitely, de definitely the circumstances. He's not the type of person I think that was plotting and planning mm -hmm. in advance through the, through the years but that it was just his, his humble um, origins and I think his management style keeps him very low key which is very admirable. I've been fortunate to work with a couple companies that had leaders like that and they are true leaders because they're not trying to be a showman. They're, they're trying to be an effective um, person to guide their, their company in an effective way. Yeah. So now by coming out when he has to, um, even probably against his own will, I mean again it shows his courage and it shows his conviction and, and also his humanity which I think is very important and why so many people have um, come to, you know, have a large amount of respect very quickly. It's unprecedented, right, for me as well, watching this. I mean, this is the national television of China, the world's most populous nation, and they're very shrewd about airtime. And yet they have, they gave three hours online live, by the way, millions of people were, were following this. And then um, piece by piece, they dissected what he was saying. They aired it, you know, um, in great detail and great length. So, Victor, why do you think the Chinese media is so generous in allowing the space for Mr. Ren to speak here? Well, first of all, this is really probably the first time that the United States uh, has declared a national emergency. It's not peanuts. It's national emergency, mostly against one company, that is Huawei. And this is truly unprecedented on the international scale. And the U.S. government, through its president, vice president, secretary of state, many, many senior leaders, are going all out in their way try to put a stop to the rise of Huawei and they are not only doing this inside the United States they are calling on many many countries all their allies for example and countries like Japan try to really put a stop to the growth and dynamism and the rise of Huawei this is unprecedented I cannot think of any other company which has been dealt with like this by the full wrath of the US government and, of course, what exactly is this company and what it is doing? Why is this company leading the 5G? Mm. And why its mission of getting the world connected is something that mankind will be grateful when it is achieved. All and this, I think, is the reason for the curiosity. And I think yeah. the Chinese state media is doing the right thing to shed as much light on Mr. Ren and Huawei also, as possible. Yeah, I don't have much time, but I think this is really a very important point because um, the feeling people get as the, the American government is working so hard, as you said, the, the president, the vice president, the, the secretary of state is trying, is doing all kinds of things to, um, to press China's rise, let's say. There seems to be a sentiment of resentment, of, um, of you know, anger, indignation on the part of the Chinese and there are calls for the Chinese people to rely on themselves to, you know, stop dealing with the United States or stop learning or interacting with the United States. But it seems that Mr. Ren gave a, a different kind of message, right, although he was very much besieged by the American government. Absolutely. I think uh, Mr. Ren Zhengfei is truly a philosophical leader and even under a lot of pressure, even under a lot of persecution by the United States government. His he, daughter is under house And his daughter has uh, yes, been arrested uh, in Vancouver uh, at the request of the U.S. government. Mr. Ren has never bad-mouthed against the United States. He has, he has always emphasized that the American people are great people and the United States is a great country and China as a country and Huawei as a company and he as a, a human being can learn a lot from the United States. And he emphasized again again and again that 5G is not a nuclear weapon. 5G is a connectivity mm. instrument and getting right. people connected is the future, sure. it's the mega trend. Sure. Mm -hmm. So Huawei is really yeah. doing exceptionally great job in this yeah. regard. Um, actually, Ren, uh, Mr. Ren expressed a profound gratitude to U.S. companies during that interview. Um, and actually that was uh, the moment where he got emotional where he said he, was, he cried when uh, he heard the news that American companies were doing all they can to um, supply as much to the companies 
company as possible. Let's listen to what he said about American suppliers. I'm very grateful to American companies. Over the past 30 years, American companies have grown with our company, and they have made many selfless contributions. They taught us how to develop. As we all know, most or dozens of our consulting firms are American firms, typically IBM and Accenture. In addition, a large number of parts and component manufacturers have supported us greatly, especially in this hour of crisis, which really reflects the conscience of American enterprises. Yeah, well, um, his kind of unexpected um, warm-heartedness, let's say, um, towards the American business circle won a lot of uh, warm feedback. For instance, there was this one viewer comment which goes, despite such heavy blows to the company, Huawei CEO still shows his gratitude towards the U.S. That's something really commendable. My heart is with you, Huawei. So, um, Thomas, what do you think... Mr. Ren, he obviously know what he's what people will hear from from. Why do you think he's trying to paint such a positive picture of American businesses at this particular moment? Let's not forget that Google just complied mm -hmm. with the U.S. ban right very soon after the U.S. government announcement. Well, I think that he again is a highly intelligent man. He's a very he started as a very humble man. He I think he understands. Um, people's emotions and, and how to move forward. By um, taking, they say, the high road, he, he keeps a better profile. He has people always can respect him on what he's doing and I think in, increases um, the view of his integrity and the integrity of the company as, as it goes forward. Mm. So I think it was a very um, um, smart move to be able to, um, uh, to do that, to be positive on all the different levels. And I think to a certain extent, the companies deserve positive treatment too. Again. This is not the American people, it is not the American companies who are um, trying to villainize um, um, his company. It's the American government for whatever reason. But again, um, you know, we have some instances where Huawei's had some problems in the past. They had, you know, a lawsuit in 2012 on theft of intellectual property from T-Mobile. In 2014, they lost a lawsuit in Seattle Federal Court. Um, and had to pay damages for um, um, theft of intellectual property. So there, th there is some history, and so I think that now it's culminated in a, in a more direct impact. And remember again, you know, we talked about before that the, um, the ban putting placed on the item list, which is the euphemism for the blacklist, has nothing to do with the back door or all the other allegations that are out there. It has to do with um, the allegation that Huawei worked with the Iranian government to um, um, or deal with American um, with, financial with services Iran, yeah. for them. So that is that is the genesis. That is the only stated reason mm. for being put on the blacklist. Yeah. So and that's also um, created the arrest of his daughter from the arrest warrant that was there. And again, remember that wasn't that was an arrest warrant that was put out in a in, in a global sense. Hundreds, thousands are put out every year. Canada has thousands of them for people who go in transit. They decided to pick her up, yeah. not the United States. Yeah. There, there would have been probably 50 other people sure. with warrants at that same day she was picked up and no one else was. Well, uh, let's take a look at another comment from the viewer uh, after um, Mr. Rin Junfei's interview. And this one goes that, uh, thanks Trump for making Huawei great again. Uh, now that Huawei has said that it was working on its own operating system and it's developed its own chips, so, in some way, could the ban make Huawei greater because it has to rely more on itself, Victor? Well, I think philosophically, uh, what the U.S. government is doing right now against Huawei and against the many other high-tech companies in China will generate the only logical result. That is, they force China into the road of self-reliance. And I would say, in a matter of years, the U.S. semiconductor business probably will be running out of steam and will hit the dead end. That is very, very definite. But on the, the other hand... President Trump is forcing the demise of the semiconductor business in the United States eventually. But on the other hand, Mr. Ren cautioned against um, doing everything by ourselves. He said we need to have the spirit of innovation in our blood, but not going out and do it because it doesn't make sense and you can't 
it, try to produce everything by yourself. It would be a waste of uh, many well, resources. And actually, he said more than that because he said that they've had several instances where they've held back. They've had the technology to go into the market and take over a significant market share, and they chose not to because they thought the competition was healthy. So they thought that they would do that. So on time and time again, he would only use the technology internally, though they could have um, put several companies out of business. Yeah. So again, he has the vision and foresight, I think, to re really understand the market okay. and, and be a global leader. All right. We're going to take a very short break. Um, Thomas Patrick Gale and Victor Gale, and after this short break, we'll continue to talk about how far-reaching the U.S. ban of Huawei may become for the tech industries of both countries. Stay with us. The ripple effect is already being felt, um, though the U.S. government uh, uh, this week delayed its ban of Huawei, allowing a 90-day temporary general license. Some Huawei partners along the supply chain have begun to feel the impact. According to one report, U.S. firms themselves could lose up to an estimated 56 billion U.S. dollars in export sales over the next five years, and the ban could cost as many as 74 thousand American jobs. So what could be the short-term and long-term impact on both the Chinese and U.S. tech industries? And while Huawei founder Ren Zhenfei dismisses the 90-day stay as bearing little meaning for his company, how will the tech giant adapt in the coming months and beyond? So for more discussion, we continue with our guests here in the studio, Thomas Patrick Gale and Victor Gao. So let me just read out some of the headlines, as I mentioned in the very beginning of the show, that uh, Mr. Ren has found, or the company Huawei has found some unlikely ally in the Western media. For instance, this uh, headline from Bloomberg says, Trump's Huawei attack is a serious mistake. Or this, the other story says uh, Trump's Huawei threat is the nuclear option to halt China's rise. Another story by Los, Angel Los Angeles Times, Trump's fight with Huawei could threaten Internet access in rural areas, of course, meaning the United States. By TechCrunch, the, um, high -tech, the, the technology press, Trump's Huawei ban also causing tech shock in Europe. And then by political, Trump's Huawei ban spooks allies' industry. So... Of course, there is the exception. I'm sure uh, Fox might be supporting President Trump's ban on Huawei. So <laughs> why the over overwhelming, however, overwhelming criticism from these U.S. media outlets towards the ban? Thomas. Well, I, I think that there is a sense of, uh, of injustice. And I think that the, um, again, in no society, um, especially in the United States, do you want to see someone taking advantage of a, of, a lesser, of a lesser body. And I think that now is how it appears with the administrative branch bringing so much uh, power and condemnation down onto Huawei. Um, remember, though, that the United States also is a country of laws. So we have the judiciary to balance that. And so I applaud Huawei for applying for that route and starting suit um, against it because that is the American way mm. to go in and challenge what they think is unfair, unjust, illegal mm. and then to prove their point in court. And then the judiciary is completely independent of the administrative branch so yeah. they can make a, make a fair ruling on that. Hopefully, hopefully. Um, what kind of shockwave is this tank, um, is this ban sending in Europe, Victor? Well, I would say this ban is, first of all, highly politically m motivated, secondly, without any any demonstrable uh, proof or evidence and uh, it actually destroys the presumption of innocence which is a cornerstone of rule of law and without rule of law or with eroding rule of law democracy will eventually deteriorate into shambles that's the big threat to democracy in a sense as well as in the United States as well as in Europe. For European countries there are many companies which deal together with a Huawei. They are either suppliers or vendors for example or other ways of cooperation and such a ban has so much ramification and many European countries or companies will be hurt and therefore this is truly a nuclear explosion it probably will very much damage Huawei, but also it will damage lots of companies in the United States as well as in Europe and in Japan and also in China's Taiwan province. Of course, of course. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, the rural access to Internet in mm. the United States, as the Los Angeles Times headline indicated. Um, explain, talk to us a bit about that. How come the ban on Huawei is going to have a devastating 
possibly a devastating effect on the rural areas in the United States? I think that the you know rural areas in the in the United States were going to be leapfrogging some of the technology. So particularly if 5G was brought in, one it's substantially more powerful and it's less expensive. So it it helps those um, those areas that are less populated, uh, larger areas mm. to be able to to bring um, something of very very high value to them um, to put them on the same par with any of the. Um, um, industrial cities that are there, so I think it it does have a does have a very great impact uh, uh, potentially. Yeah, well, a report on Monday on the potential impact of stringent export controls on technologies found that U.S. firms could lose up to 56 billion U.S. dollars in export sales over the next five years. And also, the report from the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation said that the missed opportunities threatened as many as 74,000 jobs. Um, how credible are these estimates, Victor? No, I think they are reasonable estimates. Why? Because first of all, China is the biggest telecom market in the world. And China's uh, 4G and now 5G market again will be the largest market in the world. Secondly, Huawei is a leading company in at least five different sectors mm. of the telecommunication uh, 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 field. and. Huawei is truly leading the 5G uh, development. Basically, and Huawei is buying 11, uh, bought 11 billion US dollars worth of goods from mm. American firms uh, last year. Yeah. So that means over the next five years, you can time that by five. That yes. comes to about 56. And, and also other things being equal, the demand by Huawei for US products and spare parts, for example, and software, probably will increase, if not double, in the coming few years. So it's not only the current annual sale of U.S. products to Huawei, but also it will eliminate the potential upside of Huawei's growth in the telecommunications sector in the coming few years for the U.S. products and software. So this is truly bad for the American business as a so, whole. Yeah, so in this regard, President Trump's decision to ban to, to issue this ban, is that a miscalculation or is that some, some sort of small price to pay in order to get a bigger, a bigger gain or is that a necessary pain, Victor? I think this is ideological extremism in a sense. Why? Because as foul playing, it is very much driven by political motivation. It is really trying to see devil where there is no devil, for example. It wants to elevate Huawei into a national threat to the United States. How come there are already 170 countries in the world which are using Huawei equipment and uh, uh, services? Why don't any of these countries feel so much threatened by Huawei? Why should the United States be the only country which rises up to the national... Do you have answer to that question? Why? Why Huawei? Well, I think they see things that other people tend not to see, mainly because they want to put a stop to the rise of Huawei. They believe that only by killing Huawei, if they can, mm. they can save the American 5G network or yeah. 5G services. Okay. That's not true. Thomas, your take on the same question? Well, I think that, again, um, you know, I have to correct Victor that there, there is a basis for the ban. The basis of the ban is the Department of Justice litigation that was unsealed in January of this year that it has nothing to do with the back door, it has nothing to do with cybersecurity, it has to do with Huawei uh, dealing with uh, financial matters with uh, Iran. So that's, that's the basis, that's the only legal basis well, for the ban. Yeah, Thomas, nothing else I, is brought into yeah. it, but that's brought with the political overlay to be able to take something that appears to be more minor and then, and then excel well, it into something according else. To, according to what, uh, what I understand, uh, these are al alleged violation, right. Huawei's alleged violation. It's always of, alleged. So, <laughs> so while you haven't found, while you haven't confirmed that Huawei uh, violated, you are putting this ban, right? That's the, that's the problem. Correct. Although it is a base, it's an alleged base. Basically, they can um, allege that a company did something and then issue a ban, and who's going to hold them accountable? That, I don't know. Correct. Well, and that's, and that's again where the judiciary works against the administrative branch. Mm. So if that, if that is done incorrectly, then the judiciary will over, overturn that and has the power to overturn well, that. Okay. Come on, I think. The United States government joined the international treaty on Iran, and then under Trump, the United States government walked away from the international treaty. All the other treaty 
uh, signatories stick to the treaty, China sticks to the treaty, the United Nations still back the treaty, and the United States is the only country now walking away from a treaty it already signed. So, under such circumstances, whatever the Iran situation should have been mooted by the U.S. government joining the treaty, and now whatever the U.S. government under President Trump is redoing this kind of Iran thing is really slapping its own face, I think. Be fair. I don't think the world so, so would support the United States on the Iran situation. The United States now is very, very isolated as far as the Iranian situation is concerned at all. Okay, Thomas, you, want to, you, want, you got Victor fired up there. Well, you I want think, to respond I think to that? that it, each country has their own sovereignty, has their right to make their own decision on what they think is the best way to govern the country. Um, that is done by the administrative branch. That's done by the president and executives on making the political decisions on it. Many of the American people don't agree with that. Uh, many of the world doesn't agree with that. But that's still, the American have the sovereign right to make those decisions. They have the sovereign right then to take that through and use that through the Department of Justice, um, investigation and indictment to be able to follow those forward. Of course it is allegations until the, till the end, but that is how the judicial system works. And it's the only way the judicial system can work. Well then, uh, how, how can companies have any certainty that they can operate in the United States with, without falling victim to any of these kind of uh, uh, solemn decisions? Well, I mean, are we, are we saying that Huawei did not have any interaction with the Iranians? I mean, Victor's saying they might have, but it should be excused because nobody else cares. Um, but that's still breaking that, the law. Breaking the law is breaking the law. So you have to be able to go back. But you have to go back to the basic on it. I, I agree that it appears to be an overreaction um, to um, whatever, whatever happened in that particular time period. But now yeah. it's the difficult portion of how to tease that out and then see where it is. Whether this is just showmanship hmm. through President Bush and the administration, or you know how that comes out, we shall soon no, see. I think, I think the real question we need to ask is whether there is any other situation or president where the United States would have declared national emergency or any company, whatever the allegations there are, against one single company using national emergency. No, this is really overkill. This is ideological overkill against a company. Come on, wake up the United States. Be a country with decency. Okay, Thomas. That's my point. Well, again, it, again, it comes back to it's the sovereignty of the United States to make that determination. Again, many of the people don't agree with that. They don't yeah, agree with what the Yeah, we seem to fall into a kind of a, a you know a loop talk because then you can talk about President Trump uh, doing the right thing because he has the right to do it. You know, then there is no no way to argue, you know, whatsoever. If you say the U.S. president has the sovereign right to make decisions, and you ha they have to be taken like that. Right, Thomas? Well, it, it'd be, it, America doesn't have the right to tell China what to do on many of their um, particularly domestic issues. Of course not. And so, that's, so it's the same thing. It's that one country can't tell the other exactly what's going on. The United States can't tell China to let Google into the, into the country. I mean, why isn't Google used in the country as one of the major um, internet providers? Um, why, was, um, why was Uber? Uh, forced to remove from, from China. Should that have been something the United States should have come and said, China, you can't kick Uber out. That's an American company. Of course not. So China has the right to make their decisions good or bad. The United States have the right to make their decisions good or bad. Huawei definitely is accepting that kind of decision, but we're talking about... And with grace. Uh, sorry? And with grace. And with and grace, courage. yeah. But again, I think it is still fair for us to ask the question, although it's sovereign right, but does it mean that you can reach out and uh, you know, impose your decision just the way you want it? Or I think there need to be a certain understanding. We have to leave it there. Thank you so much. No Thank time you. left. Thomas Patrick Gale and Victor Gale. And that's it for this edition of The Point. Thanks for watching. You've got The Point.